see, Wade. Van's got his best man in that brake job. Wade sure got what it takes, Tech. But frankly, isn't it an awful waste of talent? I mean, shouldn't Wade be used on really important work, like on engines? No, Zach. If you don't mind my saying so, you just put both feet in your mouth. Even though an engine might have a rough idle, it'll run. But if anything's wrong with the brake so the car won't stop right, crash. Believe me, Zach. Van knows what he's doing when he puts weight on a brake job. <clears throat> You're going to give me a swelled head, Tech, although I appreciate the compliment. Actually, Van's coming in on this job, too. I know he'll help us convince Zach that brake service calls for the best skill and know-how we can provide. I'm still from Missouri, Wade. You're going to have to show me. That's what I've got in mind, Zach. But I've got a hunch you may not realize why good brake service demands properly engineered parts and top-flight precision service. You kind of look down on brakes, and that's all wrong. Maybe we never told Zach how far brakes have come along, Van. They sure do a tremendous job today. Cars is so much heavier and go so much faster. That kind of thing. No, and we never explained how much more work brakes have to do because of higher car speeds, automatic transmissions, and reduced cooling, resulting from smaller wheels and front-end sheet metal design. How much more work do the brakes have to do now? Well, it takes almost 300 horsepower to accelerate a car weighing nearly two tons from zero to 60 miles an hour in about 10 seconds. On the other hand, we expect brakes to decelerate that car from 60 to zero in something less than half the time. So in terms of power, brakes stop the car better than the engine makes it go. Said another way, Zach, when you work on brakes, you're looking after two and one-half times as much power as a man working on the engine. And for safety's sake, that margin of brake power must be maintained. More power, huh? I'm beginning to see what you mean by having more respect. And I guess there's hope for you, Zach. How are you on handling some typical brake conditions? Why, uh, that, uh, that depends. Depends on what you've got in mind. Well, when brakes pull to one side, or when they're noisy, or when you've got a bad case of brake fade. Aren't those all just a matter of shoe adjustment? No, Zach. Adjustment is only part of the story. If that's the only thing you do, you can count on the jobs coming back. Tech's right. On brake pull, which is caused by uneven braking effort, more on one side of the car than the other, it's easy to make a wrong diagnosis. For example, if a car pulls to the left, don't jump to the conclusion that it's got too much braking effort on the left side. It could be caused by too little braking effort on the right side. Sometimes it isn't even the brake. It's the way the suspension's lined up. Suspension? You serious? I'll say I'm serious. The effect of suspension on braking has never been stressed enough. Any car that drifts away from straight ahead during normal driving and pulls in the same direction when brakes are applied probably has an alignment rather than a brake condition. Quite often, brakes get the blame. But all the work you do on brakes can't possibly correct a suspension fault. I see what you mean, Van. Got to keep suspension in mind, then. Right. And when you run across a case of brake noise, remember this. All sounds are the result of movement or vibration. Take the brake drum, for instance. It can act a lot like a bell. Strike the side of it like a clapper strikes a bell, and you'll hear it ring out. But you know, if you hold the rim of a bell firmly before the clapper strikes, that will deaden the sound. So, when checking the brake assembly and related parts in suspension and steering... See that everything's up to torque and clearance specifications. Too much play anywhere may cause vibration. Oh, then properly tightened parts prevent noise, huh? In general, yes. There are other factors, but I wanted you to understand that vibration is the source of noise. Now, we mentioned fade a minute ago. Know what we mean by that? I think so, Van, but... 
I'm not sure I know what causes fade. The main cause of fade, Zack, is a loss of friction between the lining and the drum because of too much heat. Tech's right. You see, heat changes the friction characteristics of brake lining. As temperature rises, the lining loses some of its ability to grip the brake drum. When that takes place, the driver has to press harder on the pedal to force the shoes tighter against the drums. This increases heat even more. There's a greater loss of friction. Added pressure still won't produce more braking power if the lining gets so hot that it's lost most of its friction. That's what's meant by lining fade. When too much heat causes the drums to expand, the shoes have to reach out farther to touch the drum. More brake fluid has to be displaced and pedal travel increases. Pedal travel also increases because of mechanical deflections caused by extreme pedal effort. Don't forget there are other possible causes of increased pedal travel. Too much shoe clearance, low fluid level, wrong type of fluid, air in the system due to improper bleeding, a leaking master cylinder check valve, all can cause more pedal travel. Right, Tech. Incidentally, loss of friction due to heat is typical of the linings that all cars use. So there's bound to be some fade under unusually severe braking conditions, even when everything's perfect. Our job is to work carefully and properly to control fade. Then brakes will operate well under all normal conditions with an ample margin of safety. I understand. And you certainly put me straight on fade. Well, of course, there's more to it than we've talked about. All brake parts have to be right, for instance, so maximum lining contact is maintained. If there's less than full contact, it will result in hot spots and a more severe loss of friction. There'll be increased pedal effort and reduced stopping ability for even normal driving conditions. Not only that, uneven friction that results from less than full contact at one wheel can cause a bad case of pull to the opposite side. You mean there are times when brakes have a combination of fade and pull? Yep. Quite often, correcting causes of fade also corrects many causes of pull. Correcting causes of pull often takes care of a fade condition, too, especially if there's any tendency toward brake drag. In any case, Zach, always road test a brake condition to begin with. Try the brakes at slow, medium, and high speeds. See if they make a straight line stop, pull to one side, or fade. Avoid making successive high-speed panic stops on new linings. Linings, like other parts, have to be worn in carefully until they make full contact. Now, some fellas think they can burn in new linings, but that's wrong and could lead to serious trouble. Now, during your road test, check the shock absorber action, check brake pedal effort, pedal travel and feel to make sure the hydraulic system works properly. If the owner reported that the brakes pulled on application, See how the car tracks. If the car wanders or tries to lead in the same direction as the brakes pull, there's a number of things you ought to check. Uh, before we spell out those, Wade, let's ask somebody to please turn the record over. We were talking about checking a pull to one side when the brakes are applied. Remember, what seems to be a brake condition can actually be trouble somewhere else. So check the tires. An underinflated tire or smooth tire, opposite one with good tread, can cause uneven braking. While you're at it, check wheel bearing adjustment. Loose wheel bearings in themselves can cause pull. They'll also cause noise. So be sure they're torqued properly before you check front end alignment. I see. Okay, what's next? The upper and lower control arms, Zach. Check for excessive looseness at the inner bushings and ball joints. Also, check for steering linkage looseness, especially at the tie rod ends and idler arm bushing. Check torque on the lower control arm strut attaching bolt, Zach. They should be tightened to 65 foot-pounds. That strut nut at the front end should be torqued 30 to 35 foot-pounds. That strut keeps the lower control arm in line and soaks up the major part of the braking force. Yeah, I understand that. Good. Check suspension level next. If okay, then check caster, camber, and toe-in. All should be up to specifications for the car you're working on. 
Each one plays an important part in effective braking. Manual steering cars have negative caster. That reduces steering effort at low speeds. Power steering cars have positive caster. This gives better directional stability and improves wheel returnability on turns. Make sure caster is the same on both front wheels. Positive caster on one side and negative on the other will cause a pull toward the side with negative caster when brakes are applied. And don't overlook the rear suspension. Right. Rear axle U-bolts should be tightened to 70 foot-pounds, or the axle housing will shift on the springs. Misalignment there, of course, could cause a car to drift during normal driving and pull to one side on brake application. Loose U-bolts can also cause a rear brake howl. Okay, Van. I'll check the suspension closely. Fine. Now raise the car and check for brake drag. Dragging shoes, remember, heat up and lose friction. So check pedal free play first. No play would cause brake drag. On power brake pedals, adjust the master cylinder push rod to get 1 32nd to 1 8th inch free play, 1 16th preferred. This is very important. On standard brake pedals, Free play should be one-eighth to one-quarter inch, one-eighth preferred. If some shoes drag, incidentally, and some are free, the car will pull toward the shoes that are okay. All right, but suppose pedal free play is okay, wheel alignment and suspension are okay, and yet the car pulls on brake application. Remove the drums and check the brake shoe push rod position. Push rods should seat firmly in their slots. A burr or weld flash on the web can make the push rod hang up. Check lining wear pattern next. It should be even over the full width and length. Heavy heel or toe contact can cause noise or even break lockup. Linings are ground undersize initially to avoid heavy heel and toe contact. However, they reach a full contact pattern after about four to six hundred miles of service. Approved linings, by the way, are ground ten to twenty-four thousandths under drum diameter. Occasionally, somebody might grind more than twenty-four thousandths under as a cure for noise. Uh, anybody ought to know better, Van. It not only won't do any good, it'll reduce lining contact area. That causes hot spots, which result in more fade and less braking. Okay. I won't use anything but approved shoes, properly ground. Good. Now, with a gauge, check to see if the shoe is square across its lining face within ten thousandths, with the maximum gap toward the outer edge. If not, the table might not be at right angles to the web. The shield and support plate could be out of line, or the shoe loops might not be in proper contact with the shield. Another thing, check the drum for burnt spots or roughness. Polish out any contamination on the drum surfaces. This helps prevent noise. If linings are contaminated by grease, fluid, water, or dirt, correct the cause of contamination before replacing the linings. Seal between the dust shield and wheel cylinders to keep road splash out. Yes, yeah, Zach, and use only approved replacement shoes. They're alloy steel, properly heat-treated and especially machined at the heel and toe. Good point, Tech. Non-genuine shoes without those features are dangerous. Non-genuine linings are equally risky. I see. No percentage in taking chances. Right. Now, slow shoe return can also cause drag, resulting in drift. So check it by removing the drums and carefully applying the brake pedal to expand the shoes slightly. If shoe return is slow, inspect master cylinder cups for swelling caused by contaminated fluid. Inspect wheel cylinder cups for the same fault. Replace any swollen cups, flush with alcohol, and refill with only the recommended fluid. Kinked or plugged lines are another possible cause of shoe drag. Check return spring tension, too. 
It should take 35 to 45 pounds for the shoe to break contact with the piston rod. And if I don't get that? Try a new spring. The correct springs to use are listed in this reference book. What if a new spring doesn't work? Well, the attaching return link may be damaged or out of position. At the anchor, the link should go around the rivet and be retained by a dimple in the support plate. If it isn't, replace the support plate assembly. The link cannot be serviced. It provides a compensating spring effect, by the way. It helps maintain proper return spring pressure whenever the adjusting cam is turned to allow for normal wear. Now, here's something else. A shoe that binds won't return fast either. So push the shoe until the loops are against the shield. Then release the shoe and use a 5,000th feeler gauge to see if there's a clearance between the outer support plate and anchor end of the web. No clearance means the shoe is binding. Can that be corrected? Yep. Remove the shoe and examine the loop contact pattern on the shield. It should be away from the outer edge and appear light. All other interference should be relieved. Scoring, or galling, means loop contact is too heavy. A bent loop can rub excessively, but you can bend it flush with the table edge and file off any burrs. That shoe web must be centered with the table, too. If the web is more than one sixteenth inch off center, replace the shoe assembly. Also, the lining must not overlap the edge of the shoe. If it does, file or grind off the overhang. Okay, will do. Atta boy! Now this reference book has more information on causes of pulling to one side and spells it out so you know what you're up against. Swell, Tech. I'll be sure to cover those bases. Those tips on correcting pull may also help to take care of fade, Zach. Especially when it's caused by brake drag or poor shoe returnability. Right. And now for some pointers on noise. Make sure there's 35 foot-pounds torque on the brake support plate to rear axle housing bolts. On front brakes, there should be 55 foot-pounds torque on support plate to steering knuckle bolts. Right, Tech. If there's a squeak at the end of a stop, Install the rod, spring, and retainer from this brake dampener package at the heel of each brake shoe. You'll find the procedure in the book. Suppose that doesn't work. Well, Zach, it also pays to check brake drum dampener springs. Replace any you find are too loose. Very clear, Van, and thanks. Say, if anybody has trouble getting good power brake operation, the complete adjusting procedure is in the reference book. Good news, Tech. I'll buckle down on that, and all the information we've talked about. I think I know now why brakes must have top-flight attention by the best in the business. That's the spirit, Zach. And before you change your mind, why don't you and all of our technicians give these brake service tips a tryout?